I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Hampton Board of Selectmen's meeting for July 11th. Before we start with public comment, I'd like to have a moment of silence for the uh, police officers in Dallas and the rest of the uh, the rest of the violence that's gone on in this, this country over the past week. Thank you. Public comment period. Is there anybody from the public would like to speak? You might not be able to understand me. I'm missing a couple of teeth. <laughs> Uh, legitimately wise. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that's what I was going to start off with, by the way. I was ask for a moment of silence for those police officers. Um, and just as an aside, it's the first time in my life I know what people feel like. I have a child as a police officer, and for 28 years I was one, and I never knew what that feeling was when you're a parent of one, it's out there. <laughs> and I can't, I, I, it really hit me home. I called my son at two o'clock in the morning, driving around on the cruise, going, are you okay? <laughs> you know, you, and you get such a fear. And, and I wanted to tell those families that we're all in support of them also. That's what I was gonna say. Uh, second thing for Mr. Bean, I don't know if you read in the paper, uh, so that can be, that the state of New Hampshire published what they made it in a July 4th in Hampton Beach in the, the parking meters. In one weekend, they did $105,000, three days. We did uh, roughly around 65, 66. But when they say they don't have enough money and they've cut down the, police, uh, the state police down there and everything, that's just one weekend in the parking meters. So I can't imagine between a meals tax and that <laughs> how we are being treated like we are the town of Hampton, you know. And, and I thought you'd be interested in that if you hadn't read it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, you know, the other point is I'd like to offer you my, as a 45-year employee of the town that uh, I would like to support whatever you might consider to be increases for the part-time, not me, but the part-time employees of the town. Uh, they work very hard. Uh, I have people that work with me, I don't want to say for me, at the, at the town. They've been here eight years and received a nickel when you give that one and a half pay, percent pay raise. They ended up getting a nickel raise. <laughs> so I just want you to know that they work very hard and they, we, want, we're, we are the lowest paid not me, the people that work there, our children, <laughs> are the lowest paid people uh, of their, doing that job than anybody at the beach. Just as a quick example, the precinct starts off at $9 an hour, halfway through the summer they go to nine fifty. At the end of the summer they give them a $350 bonus if they stay the summer. And they give them a 50% raise halfway through July if they make it that far. So they go from nine to nine fifty to the end. They get a three hundred fifty dollar bonus. The parking people, and that just as a comparison. That's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, can I ask you a question real quick? Are you there? Sure. You see, we're also going to discuss the upper limit authorization. Yeah. Who would you recommend that? Or feel comfortable having authority uh, to? Uh, uh, I don't think any of you are aware of. It. I've been trying to get them raised as far for ten years. <laughs> you know with different things and I put I have given Diana budgets you know I, I mean we're going to I, also think, I, I, I think if we we could have we could put a plan in place 
where you could start someone off at X dollars and tell them no. to come. I, I'm sorry. I, I, my question is the second part we're talking about is the limit of twenty dollars maximum. Oh, you need charging. Yes. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't on, to pay for no, that. no. I'm sorry. The on-demand aspect of what what number having the experience. If you want to believe this, that the, the parking lot beyond us, across from like G Street, they hold about 125 cars. They don't open. They open after we're full. <laughs> And then they go to $35, $40, The maximum we go to is 20 Labor Day weekend, excuse me, on July 4th weekend, we were filled at 9.15 a.m. because we were at $20 and everybody else was at 30 and 35 we We're only allowed to go up to $20. So if the board considers adjusting that, what would you recommend? I, I'd recommend on hot weekends. Sure. Holiday weekends, Fridays, anything of a major thing. Uh, I, I, I think thirty, thirty-five dollars is a will be under everybody. <coughs> I don't right. want to use the word Ray, but you don't want to kill Thank it. You. Kill it too. And, and and we are a community, but I would recommend something in that area. Okay. But the same discussions we had before, not because it's me, but you know, obviously it's random and stuff. Put down to five dollars some days and right. some days we have thirty five. It was it was kind of uh, Sad sitting there at 9.15 a.m. and not be able to take a car, <laughs> and they're going to 45 or 50 dollars. I actually saw it at 60 dollars. And there's a lot of negative comments have come out about that. Yep. I constantly. Actually, I hear, hear it constantly. Right. We'll address that. We can discuss that. I just want to point, just to make this clear, um, <laughs> the... The police have not cut, the, I mean, the state has not cut the amount of police, according to the information that we got from Nancy Stiles. They've, brought, they've got money from another source than uh, the budget. Well, we can discuss that when the chief comes well, up. Well, I just don't want to leave the public, because I've been telling people that there hasn't been an... Uh, well, in my understanding, initially they, they did. They cut the details, and not to get off track on Mr. DeMarcus, but my understanding is they did cut um, the funding in the budget for Hampton Police details by half. But they put other After money they were back discussions, into it. They started to, and the chief can more confirm this later, but my understanding is they started to pull from other areas and other grant funded areas to help augment, uh, but the chief can speak to, okay. I mean, certainly we need trying to a discussion work. about sure. that because absolutely. I don't want to leave that out yep, there for absolutely. the public. Yep. And I think the reason we got some <coughs> is because Bobby, uh, call on Bobby worked with us for about 15 years in Hampton Beach. As long as we and get it, I don't care how it, like it, it comes from. Thank God we knew Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? Yes, good evening. Um, I agree with Victor, by the way. That was an incredible presentation that Phil made with all of the money that the state is sucking up and not giving to Hampton. Um, I uh, had to chuckle after I talked with you uh, on June 27th uh, because I read the email from former resident Brian Doherty. People move away from Hampton, but they can't stand being away and not putting their fingers in the pie. So I thought that was rather uh, clever. Uh, let's see, precinct commissioner, former selectman, member of the Lease Land Committee, an attorney, but he didn't walk away from town with the leased land he wanted to acquire at the beach. Nevertheless, I'm sure there's a lot of land in Arizona. <coughs> uh, I came to do a quick follow-up on the perambulation situation. Uh, I talked uh, the following day after I came in and spoke with you uh, to a friend of mine who happens to be an attorney, and I explained the circumstances of the Seabrook perambulation. And uh, he said that there would be no need at all for the selectman to go to Superior Court because it appears that if the statutory requirements for the perambulation were not met, then it was a nothing. It was just a meeting that friends had to talk things over. So I wanted to share that information with you because I thought it was only fair since I had come in and spoken to you the night before. Uh, I will say uh, that I sent an email to all of you to confirm the new information that I had received. And I sent a copy of that email to Attorney Gerald as well, in fairness to him as town council. Um, my email to Attorney Gerald went right through to um, Regina and to Phil, but Waddell, Bridal, and Griffin came back blocked. I hope that wasn't deliberate. The town is paying 
for the internet service that we have here. And it's service so that the public can contact their elected officials. And I'm hoping that that's not being abused. You all have town email addresses, which is what I use. Just very quickly, so that there's no question that that is not the case. Nothing's no uh, things being blocked. I'm sure you know how to use it. Mistake, but I don't want the public. Well, to I, think. I knew how to use it I enough to get it to the I, the I, don't, I don't there's know anything not. about this block stuff. There's no blockage. It's so good let's idea. Well, when that the go. mailer demon comes up, and it was all the same email, Jim, and it was all. Uh, Regina and Phil it's and not Mark a Gerald conspiracy, Bell. Mrs. Wallace. So Lane. I just want to uh, continue really quickly on the follow-up on that perambulation. You need to check on that, please. If that perambulation did not comply with RSA 51, you're going to have to notify Seabrook that you need to redo, and you'll need to notify the archives and records up in Concord because it's certainly not fair to the public to have an improper document filed up there. So I hope that one or some of you have at least talked to town council to check on the status of that perambulation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And just so you know, I have blocked nobody from my email, so I don't know what happened, but I did not receive that email. Well, Regina and Phil have nicer emails, well, apparently. Maybe, but I received it when I received it from... I haven't had any shows. problem with mine, and I am not even aware that you can block somebody. So, is there anybody else who would like to speak from the public? Mr. Preston. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to touch briefly on the second appointment. Parking lot authorization for increase of maximum parking limit fees to the market demand. I think it's a slippery slope. I, I just learned, and I honestly didn't know if the maximum was 20. And if they're going to, you know, I think we just heard that um, the manager of the lots recommended, you know, 30 max, whatever. I don't know when it was set, but just because everybody else does it doesn't mean we have to. And I, I'm the type that I'd rather have repeat business than one and done. Because when you start nailing people for 40 50 $60, which we've all heard down there, People leave, they throw the trash on the ground, and whatever they do to get even, and then they never come back, and then they badmouth us forever. I think the town's done a great job. I think the precinct's done a great job. I think we need to sit down after September, after the Seafood Fest, and see, because if we look back to this, this intersection of Brown and Ashworth is what I call the hub. It needs a hard look. The municipal park in both the town and this precinct were butters. It is apples to apples. A few years back, I came in, and I pointed out that the precinct was making over five, close to $600 per space over what the town was making. And I don't think it was because the prices were, what I, you know, for lack of a better word, gouging. You know, is it because of, you know, Brown Ave entrance? I don't know. We need to take a look at it. But let's visit this right after the Seafood Fest and before the HBAC takes a position on parking and transportation issues in Hampton Beach. It seems the town, the state, and the precincts need better communication at times, and I firmly believe this is a time. Let's see what we can do for the Hampton taxpayers' benefits. Let's not get greedy. Let's work towards repeat business and not one and done visits to Hampton Beach. Um, I do want to say that the governor, I don't know how many people are familiar Everybody's busy doing different things, different times of the year. Nancy Stiles filed a bill on the state park plates. I know you have one, Jim. The governor signed it on June 3rd. It took effect July 1st. You are going to be able to park for about 80 days for free as, as a benefit to what you already get. You're going to get 10 days in September, 20 in October, 20 in April, 20 in May, and 10 in June that you're going to get. They're going to be Monday through Friday, September 15th to June 15th, when the state parks is in the season. It's a great thing. It's user-friendly to the businesses. I'd like to see this board consider doing the same thing with the town lots on those same days and that same schedule to let town residences go in all of these because the spaces are available. We have the numbers. You know, it's not like you can say this is my opinion, but by looking at the facts, we can back it up, you know, and create more of an off-season and, and work better to get our residents some benefits down there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? <coughs> I'll bring it back to the board for announcements and community calendar. I don't have anything, Mr. Chairman. 
Yeah, I would just like to say that uh, just recently in the last week or so, uh, residents have gotten their letters on their new assessments. And a lot of people have been calling about that and complaining. Just remember that it's the assessment is the evaluation of your house, and it's the five-year evaluation. It's not just based, not a one-year assessment that went up. And that it's not necessarily tagged to the, to the tax rate that we have now. With the assessment going up, the tax rate may go down. So don't worry that you're going to be paying that much more extra money on the current tax rate. So just remember, it's the evaluation of your property. It's the assessment of your property, not the tax rate right now. Mr. Mead. Negative, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Griffin. Thank you. And I have nothing. So consent agenda, Solicit solicitation permit, parade and public gathering license, a license for coin-operated amusement devices, a one-day entertainment license, a raffle permit, and a request for no objection for service of outside uh, alcohol outside. I need a motion. I make a motion. Motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Unanimous. Appointments. Chief Sawyer. Good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before the board again. Uh, usually I am accompanied by the, uh, the Deputy Chief, but uh, actually today was his first day at the uh, National Academy. So I sent him a nice email this morning wishing him a great first day of school, and uh, <laughs> he replied accordingly. <laughs> so I wish him the best. He'll be back in a short 10 weeks. He returns to us, uh, graduates, I believe it's September 17th. So looking forward to uh, having him back. Um, have you all received my quarterly update? Um, I want to be clear that when I submitted that, that was probably about four hours before the tragedy uh, in Dallas occurred. I submitted that on Thursday per our protocol for the reports to get out to the board and your packages. So it did not contain anything relevant to that issue. Uh, I would like to touch upon it um, briefly. Uh, a lot's been said. A lot of things are still incoming on information. And I know a lot of people are very upset about this tragedy and some of the things that have been leading up to it and what we're experiencing in law enforcement today. While it happened in Dallas, Texas, thousands of miles away, it has an impact throughout the law enforcement community. I think I've highlighted on every appearance before the board the issues we're having with our recruiting and retention. These are the type of incidents that uh, really cause problems nationwide, the tragedy alone itself. but the ripple effect that it has on trying to get good people to come into this line of work. And part of the unfortunate part is, is when these tragedies occur, you have so many people without knowing the facts of what occurred, why it occurred, who did what, start pointing fingers at each other. And I'd simply ask that anybody that is concerned about these issues or the things that led up to it, take the time to learn the facts. Take the time to go home and do a little self-reflection about what you could do better as a citizen in this, in, in this town, this state, and this country to make things better. Because if people continue acting the way they're acting and polarizing and pointing fingers at each other, it's not going to stop. It's going to continue. And it's just time for people to take a hard look at themselves before you start pointing the finger at everybody else. And that includes law enforcement. We're not immune from what's going on in this country and the controversies. We have to take stock of what we do and be accountable for our actions with the public. But the response from people that think that shooting it and targeting police officers is the solution to the problems in this country is just outrageous. And anybody that buys into that is just really going down the wrong track. And we really need to uh, take a step back and take a breath. Uh, with that, the silver line is um, the number of phone calls, people just walking up to me that known and unknown and shaking your hand and thanking you for what you do and offering the condolences is, is just heartfelt. Um, and an amazing thing happened the day after across the country in the town of Hampton. Police officers showed up and went to work and did their job. Okay, on a Friday, half of our force is probationary, part, the part-time officers. They all showed up. Nobody called in sick. Nobody turned in their equipment. They showed up to do their job and, by all accounts, did it at a professional level. So to the men and women of the Hampton Police Department, I want to offer my thanks. 
uh, in deep appreciation. It's an amazing thing to see people coming into this workforce. And it's harder and harder to get people. But I've said it before, I'll take quality over quantity any day of the week. And I can assure you that the Hampton Police Department is providing quality service to its citizens to the best ability that we can. So with that, uh, I just want to go over my report real quick. It's a standard format that I provided before. Our current staffing level is 34 sworn uh, full time. On June 17th, we began our summer season. Our Sir Jason Jackson, Robert Kenyon, and Vitaly Sorokins were selected to serve as corporals. The corporals serve as direct supervisors for our part time special officers during our busiest times at the beach. In years pay and past, HPDA utilized two corporals, but this year, with the increasing levels of visits to the beach, decreasing levels of experience within our part time special officer ranks, I determined it was necessary to increase the level of supervision. We currently still have one officer out of service due to due related injuries. This is a long-term recovery. We're hopeful that he can come back this year, but that remains to be seen. Our part-time staffing, our sworn is 32. We currently include eight new part-time officers in our roster. Two part-time officers are currently on leaves of absence, bringing the number of working part-time officers to 31. Part-time academy is scheduled to begin in August. Uh, we have three candidates attending this academy. They'll come back to us in the summer of 2017 uh, to join the working special officers. Uh, we are hopeful that with the recent changes in funding to the New Hampshire Police Academy signed into law by the governor, that we will once again serve as a key Seacoast host for the Special Part-Time Officers Academy. Uh, as you may recall, we've been hosting that for several years. It is simulcast from the Police Academy in Concord, but due to a funding shortage, uh, the academy previously had been funded by the penalty assessment fund that was falling far short of the needs of the academy. They signed into law that is now a line item in the budget, so the funding is there, and we're hopeful, uh, talking to Director Vidim, that we're going to be able to continue that program, which I find very valuable to host it at Hampton PD because we get that much more exposure to our officers. Our activity, um, this is compared to the same time last year. I will touch base a little bit on the 4th of July, but that is not included in this. This is uh, April 1st to June 31st. Our calls for service are up 8%. Arrests are up 4%. DWI is down 3%. Drug offenses down 29%. Incident reports uh, reported are 25% down. Offenses are down 11%. Felonies are up 11%. Motor vehicle stops, uh, an incredible rate uh, of up 40%. Parking tickets are down 15%, and accidents are down 11%. Department operations to include the 4th of July weekend. Ongoing issues with heroin, uh, with heroin and opioids have plagued the region. Hampton had one overdose death attributed to opioids in the second quarter of 2016, bringing our year total to three overdose deaths. We continue to work with our local, state, and federal partners to combat this issue. Our preseason beach activity was busy due to the great weather experienced in the region. Our officers did an out job, outstanding job maintaining order during those hot, busy days when schools across the region would have skip days and the students would descend upon Hampton Beach. After experiencing the large crowds early in the season, the decision was made to bring in experienced officers from other municipalities to augment our staffing levels. This has proven to be very helpful in maintaining order and providing for good traffic flow through the beach area. The weekend, of July 4, uh, the weekend of the 4th of July was challenging as the weather was warm and sunny and large crowds came to the beach for the entire weekend. A reasonably quiet and safe holiday weekend was celebrated due to the many officers who came in on extra duty to provide for public safety that weekend. Special thanks to the New Hampshire State Police, Rockingham County Sheriff's Department, University of New Hampshire Police Department, Epping Police Department, Exeter Police Department, and Greenland Police Department who all provided personnel and equipment to assist with a busy weekend. I'd also like to thank the Seabrook Police Department for the continued cooperation and coordination of traffic control along ocean, the Ocean Boulevard corridor. Assistance was also received from New Hampshire DOT, which allowed the use of their variable message boards as part of our traffic control plan for the holiday weekend. The Lawrence, Massachusetts Police Department donated the use of crowd control fence, which assisted keeping pedestrians out of the busy traffic over the holiday weekend. I would like to thank each of those communities and agencies for the generosity which greatly assisted the Hampton Police Department with a successful traffic control plan. With the 4th of July holiday behind us, we continue with our summer operation. This will include the continued training and acclimation of our new officers. With good weather, we anticipate large crowds of beachgoers and those attending assorted entertainment venues. The department also continues its operational planning for the many special events scheduled out to the fall to include Children's Week, Labor Day weekend, Seafood Festival, and a variety of running and bicycling events. I've also included um, 
our Part A and uh, NIBRS crime reports. I'm not going to go into detail of those. Those are for your review. And if you have any questions on how to interpret those, I'd be glad to uh, answer those if you want to send those to me in email format or in a conversation later on. With that, I'd uh, take any questions from the board. Virginia. I don't have any questions, but I just want to say that you and the department are doing a great job, and everyone that I talk to has just, they're amazed with the police presence down the beach, also throughout town. Thank you. And with what you do with UNH and the Sheriff's Department, and I mean, I'm down there and I'm looking, and there's police everywhere, and that's really what we need down there, and I just really appreciate it. The flow of traffic, everything after the fireworks, it's great. Thank great you. job. Couldn't ask for better. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, good report, and, and I agree 100% with what you said, that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, and pointing fingers is being part of the problem that people should try to do in their own life what they do. And also, I'd like to say that, you know, that, that I feel very safe in Hampton because of the well-trained police department. Fourth of July weekend, it was great to see some police pre presence up on North Beach, and they did put a stop to one of the private... Uh, fireworks that were going off, which wasn't too popular doing, but, you know, it's a safety concern. But so I, I think you, you guys are doing a great job. It's great to see some things down, the DWI's down, that, that's good. I believe we're still up for the year, but uh, we, we went out really early in the year and really aggressively went after the impaired driving because it's, it's a serious public safety issue. Um, so I, I'm hoping we've turned the corner on that issue and that we continue the downward trend in, in that area. Yeah, motor vehicle stops up 40%. I know I got stopped the other day, and the police was very, very uh, <laughs> pleasant and, and nice person. He didn't say, what are you, an idiot? And that was nice. Was that in the uh, supercharged Mini Cooper? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and it will happen every time, Jim. Uh, Chief, uh, your profession is uh, suddenly, with sudden onset uh, in this country, probably become the uh, singular most difficult profession uh, to uh, serve in and uh, lead in outside of uh, our military forces uh, that are engaged in combat operations. So uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for uh, <coughs> protecting uh, property and uh, life in this town. Uh, the chairman and I sat in on your operations brief on uh, July 4th. The uh, higher and adjacent units that uh, participated down there under your leadership and the leadership of your uh, executive staff uh, was outstanding. It was a very successful weekend. As we uh, move into the budget season, as we look at uh, compensation, uh, we look to reinforce your department uh, in terms of uh, um, pay, in terms of uh, uh, retention, in terms of developing additional skill sets and incorporating assets from the state and adjacent communities to uh, really uh, overcome the challenges of the surge population that you uh, so effectively uh, manage and protect us uh, from uh, and serve at the beach and in this town. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, I have to uh, agree with everything that's been said here. Um, you're doing a great job um, and continue to do a great job. Now, what is the story about the uh, the amount of police, state police that are coming? Has it been restored as we were led to believe? Well, let me give you the history first so just everybody can understand the context of what occurs. In a town like Hampton, the state police can only come in and operate at the invitation of the chief of police of that community or directed in by the attorney general. The state police have since I've come to this police department, I've always had an open invitation from Chief Wren to Chief Sullivan and now me. I, I, I encourage them to come in and work with us, and my only, my only rule is anybody that comes in to work with us, we coordinate our efforts, which I have to thank uh, Colonel Quinn and uh, Lieutenant Vetter that the relationship between the Hampton Police and the Hampshire State Police has never been better. Uh, I speak to the Colonel two or three times a week on issues of the region and specifically to the beach. Uh, before David left for the academy, he would speak almost daily with Lieutenant Vetter to try to coordinate our efforts. Where you have a crossover of jurisdiction, you want to try to coordinate so you're not wasting efforts in the same area that somebody else is already working. Um, I've, I've found that to be very effective. Um, the way we used to schedule the state police is we'd sit down with a calendar in April and we'd map it out for the whole summer. But that couldn't take into effect uh, or into account what the weather was going to be. So those conversations now happen on a weekly basis. The colonel has directed the Lieutenant Vetter, who previously worked for the Hampton Police Department and is a resident of the town of Hampton, so he has intimate knowledge of our operation. We talk weekly and coordinate our efforts on a weekly basis, taking into account weather, 
and events. So I think it's a much more efficient use of taxpayer money on both the state and local level. Um, to the end of what occurred is through the legislative process, the line item for the state police details was cut in half during the legislative session, which caused um, some problems as we were moving forward to do our normal scheduling uh, for the state police details to come down and augment the, the Hampton Police Department. The colonel was good enough to try to direct some of the other patrols that they have. They're funded a little bit different than, say, an entity like a municipal police department. A lot of what the state police does is highway and traffic enforcement projects that they can move around to different parts of the state. Knowing the, area, the issues we were having, a lot of that was moved down into our region, not just the town of Hampton, but the whole Seacoast area as a whole, to try to support that influx of tourists we get in the preseason um, that really causes us our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is, is that time between um, when the warm weather starts and when we start our summer special schedule, which started on June 17th this year. You may have seen that video of one of our officers being surrounded by approximately 300 people while he's trying to make an arrest. Those are the type of things that happen, and that's when it happens. So in, tr in an attempt to try to have more of a police presence, the colonel was good enough to try to direct more uh, assets, not necessarily beach detail assets, but other assets down to our region, which was very helpful. The governor, in turn, had seen some of these things that were going on, and a letter, I believe, was sent by the town manager and the board to get some more support, spurred the movement of some funds, I can't give you specifics, to try to get more troopers down there to help us. The problem they're experiencing, like we are all experiencing, is a shortage of personnel. And the state police have to cover other, uh, other issues throughout the state. So the lack of state police presence, or the perception is, it's not a lack of willingness on the part of the state police, the colonel is the leader of that, of that agency. They're giving us everything they can when they can. But we did have an issue, uh, the other night we had a uh, sobriety checkpoint over the bridge in Seabrook that we consistently uh, participate in. Unfortunately, there were not enough troopers to man the beach detail and the sobriety checkpoint. So some of the beach detail, detail officers went over the bridge to work that, which I believe was the proper allocation of the assets available. It's just we're working at a time where there aren't as many available police officers to come to work, which spurred my decision to bring in outside agencies to assist us on those times I felt it was necessary. That is a program I plan to continue uh, utilizing as a the shortage of qualified people within the Hampton Police Department and the, the issues that the state police are experiencing, we're going to use that to balance that out. So you feel like you're being supported by the governor and the to state? To the best of their ability, to they the are supporting us. I, yeah. I have no complaints with the state police <clears throat> and the governor's efforts to support the Hampton Police Department its mission. They're giving us everything they can. And as um, the head of the town, Emergency planning, the, you're the emergency planning coordinator. Emergency management director. Director. Right. Uh, could you tell us what your uh, role is there or what? My role is covered by statute. My actual authority, um, as far as acting as emergency management director, actually only is in effect after the governor declares an emergency. But part of the supporting role is the administrative function of providing. Um, reports to New Hampshire Homeland Security Emergency Management, uh, liaison when we have issues like the snow, the snowstorms we experienced, coordinating with the finance director to try to get all the data to support as much reimbursement as the town can get in those incidents. Ironically, we just received our, uh, the gradings that just came out for uh, the Seabrook drills that we did uh, last year, or actually this year, early in the year. Uh, you know, I, I was very proud of uh, the operation that we conducted simply because most of the people in the room were very new to emergency operations. So the folks that were the evaluators were very complimentary of our operation, and the, I think the grades that we have uh, reflect that. I'll be more than happy to share those after I take a little time to digest them and go over them a little more in depth and present them to a, uh, the group in the EOC so they understand uh, what, what our that we did well and some things we need to work on. Uh, but a lot of good accomplishments came out of that. So you were very comfortable as your, uh, as the director? Oh, I would not say that. I would say that <laughs> I, I'm very comfortable doing my job as a police chief. Emergency management is kind of one of those, those things where um, there isn't a school you go to for it, although the state is in the, in the process of developing a, an emergency management uh, director's school, mm -hmm. which I would look forward to attending to try to Sometimes the speak we use at the local level doesn't translate up to the folks up in Concord sometimes, and vice versa. It's hard to understand uh, that type of thing if you weren't brought up in that. Um, so 
working with emergency management is a challenge, uh, but I think we're doing a pretty good job with it. But I, and I think I've brought this up before. I, I think we need to take a hard look at how we budget and how we do our emergency management. You know, if you look at other communities, particularly if you look at the town of Seabrook, they have a separate emergency management director and a separate budget and staff for that. And I think at some point, it's not so much the radiological event, the number of weather-related incidents we've incurred in this community in my, my time at the command level, uh, it's challenging. And I think that's an area where we could probably work on a little bit better. Um, so I'd say to say that I'm well versed in it, no, I'd be lying if I said that, but it, I'm, I'm working hard to try to get up to the challenge. Speed Thank you very much. Thank you. You talked about earlier about the fencing that you got from Lawrence. Yeah, unfortunately, we did not. Um, and I can't say enough to the city of Lawrence and, and the chief that uh, allowed us to use it. It's just they didn't have the same amount available to us as last year. Um, I have been in discussions with the Beach Precinct and with the HBAC to try to get some support for funding to uh, purchase more of the fencing. My ultimate goal would be able to go from G Street all the way up to the area we refer to as Ashcore, uh, where the road divides uh, divides there right by the Ashworth, uh, Mrs. Mitchell's, if you're familiar with that area, to run fence the entire length of, uh, of Ocean Bullet up to there, and then on the east side of the road, uh, that length from the, uh, the Banshell, just kind of hurting the folks into the, the crosswalks to the best of our ability. It seems to work pretty well. It seems to get people to use the crosswalks when they don't. And when we have enough fencing, I don't lose my voice from being yeah, right there at the end of the fence line. I was a little frustrated with the, the crowd. I think I recognized them. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, other thing is, um, you, you talked about you know the the situation you know, down in Dallas and the situation of people uh, uh, and police officers. Uh, just you know, get out, talk to these guys. If if you see a detail working in your area, a traffic detail, bring them out some water. I, I've done I might my wife's done that a couple of times. She's, they've been working out on Toll Farm Road. And on some of those hot days, she drives by and just hands them a bottle of water. And, and the officers appreciate it, and I should have put it in my report, but I wanted to thank um, the Chamber of Commerce, and particularly Dave and Kara Hartnett. For, uh, there was one concern that a lot of business people had that because of the turnover we've experienced in the special officer rank, um, a lot of the officers are unknown, you know, and, and I joke around, I drive by somebody, does he really work for us, you know, and <laughs> it's just there's so many new people um, coming into the into the force and a lot of people are going on uh, to other endeavors uh, to keep track of that and to give that connection to the community they serve, and which is the special officers primarily down at the Beach Precinct. So Dave came up with an idea of hosting a cookout to uh, just introduce some of the people to the business community and let them know it's okay. You know, I'm a big proponent. Go in and say hi to the vendors. I'm, I'm okay with it. And, and have a cup of coffee and talk to people. You're never going to find me criticizing you as long as you're doing it out in the public and out in the open. I want my officers seen because, it, to me, the reason we had such a great Fourth of July is because we had a lot of officers and they were where they were supposed to be with a good traffic plan and, and that, that <coughs> saying. Everybody did their job. But you got to be out there and people got to know you to make that effective. And I think the new folks, it's just a learning curve um, and getting out there. But I thought that was a great idea. And I believe we're going to make that an annual event to host a cookout with the chamber with all the new officers and the new firefighters to get all their emergency personnel familiar with the business people that uh, these are the people we serve. And, and it'd be great to get to know some of them. Having been down there on, on uh, the 4th of July night, it was amazing to see that traffic all pretty much back to normal by 10.30, 11 o'clock. Yeah, it was um, one of those things I did take note of is the year before, we were back to normal traffic operations by 11 o'clock. Now, it took a little longer. Uh, we were back to normal when we read our last traffic post at midnight. What that told me, and having driven around and looking, our parking, our parking lots were full to capacity. Um, it was one of the larger crowds I've seen in a few years. Um, but the, the key, and, I, and we said this before, the key to keeping the violence level down is keeping the traffic moving. People that drive for several hours to come to Hampton Beach, and there were people from as far away as Springfield that drove a few hours in Fourth of July traffic to get to our to our event, and then had to sit in traffic to leave. That can be very frustrating, and, and bad things can happen when the traffic goes to gridlock, and we just don't want that to happen. So the number of folks we were able to assign to that traffic plan, and I, and I have to compliment uh, Lieutenant Gidley and Lieutenant Goditis for putting that plan together and enacting it and getting it to go. 
Um, I stood there at D Street where I always stand and that traffic within 20 minutes was flowing. It flowed, it wasn't going fast, it was moving, but it flowed. It, you never got the stop, uh, which is, is essential to our operations. So I can't thank them enough and the officers and their efforts because it may be the dirty work and doesn't get a lot of credit, but it's also the work that prevents bad things from happening. So, to speak? Yeah, I just wanted to, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, commend the chief on a creative solution that's been touched on a couple of moments. I ask you to amplify a little bit on the mutual aid group coming in, UNH and others, and explain to the public a little bit more how that's going on. We, and again, just for the board's sake, this is a very creative solution to that problem of not being able to hire specials, and you should be commended for, for a creative solution to that. We have traditionally utilized the New Hampshire State Police to support us and the Rockingham County Sheriff's Department. I want to thank the Colonel, obviously, and Sheriff Hero for their support and the continued support in our operations. But we, we saw that there was a significant deficiency in our numbers at critical times. Um, and with the shortcomings in recruitment nationally, uh, we had to come up with a solution. So I began uh, floating the idea. I, I currently serve as the president of the Seacoast Emergency Response Team, which is our tactical response team regionally. To draw upon these chiefs that I already have mutual aid agreements with, um, and whether they would be willing to allow their officers to come down and augment the Hampton Police Department on detail uh, on those busy, uh, the hot days and the days we have big events. Um, I didn't take this decision lightly because now you're bringing in other officers um, that you haven't hired, but the relationship we have with this, uh, the CERT community, uh, I trust the chiefs that they would not send me people that couldn't handle the challenge of working at Hampton PD. Um, and it is a challenge. It's very, it's a very unique situation, uh, law enforcement wise. A number of the officers came down, veteran officers, and they just, as much as they've worked with us over the years, we're astonished at the volume and the number of people that we deal with on a daily basis, and how we do it seamlessly and transition from call to call. Um, so I believe it's been a good experience. The, the departments I highlighted in the report have been the, the departments I've been going to, and one of the things I've tried to highlight is dealing with departments that are used to dealing with crowds. And obviously one of the biggest problems we experience is people that have overindulged, particularly juveniles, people that shouldn't be drinking in the first place, and how to appropriately deal with those issues because one bad decision can be, can be that spark to cause a serious civil disorder problem. Um, we bring in people that have trained and actually practiced that trade dealing with those types of environments. Probably not to the degree they experience in Hampton, but I think it's been a positive relationship that we've had. Conversely, we're also willing to go up and help those agencies out. We already uh, have gone up and helped out UNH at a number of their events, and we've helped out Epping up at the, uh, the dragway. They're now the host of the uh, Hot Rod Championship, so those draw big crowds similar to what we get and we coordinate our efforts accordingly. Uh, but it's, I think it's been a good relationship and a program I believe we're going to be utilizing for a while. Very good. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. The next one is Diana Martin, Parks and Recreations Director. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight. Ready. Okay, so we've been hopping the last couple of months. Um, in the Parks Department, we've got two Parks employees that have been working since January. They're in full swing right now. Fiber has been ordered and we're waiting the arrival to spread it on all the playgrounds. So that's the playground surfacing. True Green Chemlon has completed their maintenance program for the Town Hall, Gazebo, and Tuck Field for the season. The parks crew has been doing a lot of work on the field and the facilities by painting ball fields for the Correct Softball League and the Men's Softball League and other um, games that Winnicott or whatever might have. We have been mowing the fields and picking up trash around the parks every day. We have put up signage at the beach and mosquito signs around the park. We have put up sunscreen dispensers that we got this year at Tuckfield and Eaton Park. The parks crew is doing the daily cleanups and maintenance of our facilities. Um, we're organizing the playground equipment that's going to go on to Kids Kingdom Playground and to get that replaced with the help of volunteers and hopefully the help of the Hampton, um, the USS Hampton crew that's in town. And 
then on a personal note, I just wanted to let you all know that I took a national certification exam, and um, I passed. It was a very difficult exam, but it's a, playground, a certified playground safety inspector. Um, parking lots. The Asheville Fab parking lot opened up at the end of March this year. So far in the lots, we've made $228,889. Last year, we opened the lot around the same time, and at this time last year, this is um, going up through the 4th of July weekend, we've made $171,619. And I think <clears throat> I would attribute a lot of that because, as the chief said, the week 4th of July weekend was fabulous weather, and the beach was packed. So in last year, 4th of July weekend, the weather wasn't quite as nice. So. That's a lot of it right there. And then um, we've been talking a little bit about the pricing in the lots down at the beach, so we can talk about that after this um, report is done. And then uh, for recreation programs, we got a lot of stuff going on. We've uh, scheduled the fields and are preparing fields for softball and baseball, as I said, with soccer and tennis as well. We've completed all the paperwork for our camp counselors. We've done all the training, and they are up and running. We're in, in week three of, of Tuckfield Summer Day Camp, which is full this year. Again, record numbers. <coughs> our Co-Rec Softball League and Men's Softball League are both underway. We've only had a couple of rainouts, but so I've only had to reschedule a couple of games, which is great. Uh, the K-2 Sports Program has finished up for the school year. We had our annual June Senior Citizen Club meeting and luncheon at the Old Salt last month. Our department um, bought Red Sox tickets for the 2016 season, but both games were at Yankee Stadium and both games were sold out. One of the games is actually this weekend coming up. We had a trip to Foxwoods this past Saturday. And we've set up a number of summer programs and camps that are on our website and in our spring summer brochure. And these include the Tuckfield Summer Day Camp, Surfing Lessons, Archery Lessons, Challenger Soccer Camp, Golf Lessons, Warrior Basketball Camp, Lego Camp, Theater Camp, Watercolor Classes, Tennis Lessons for both children and adults, Arts in the Park programs weekly for the, during the summer, um, Girls Lacrosse Clinic, Camp A Lot of Fun, Sports Conditioning Clinic, Flag Football Training Camp, and all of these camps. Some of them have started and some are coming up in the next few weeks or so. Um, we have our annual Strawberry Festival uh, tomorrow at the Victoria Inn that we do in partnership with the Fire Department. Uh, we have a number of theater productions set up for the adults and seniors at both the Gunkle Playhouse and the North Shore Music Hall. These include Funny Girl, which has already gone by, Mary Poppins, uh, Singing in the Rain, Spam a Lot, Christmas Carol, and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and Million Dollar Quartet. We've also set up a trip to the Merrill Auditorium to see the Army Jazz Ambassadors on November 13th. We have a senior citizen clunch. Senior Citizen Club, Senior Citizen Luncheon Trip, sorry, at DeMillo's at the end of August. We have set up a New York City day trip for November 19th. We set up trips to Canyon Country and Yosemite National Parks for the 100th anniversary of the National Parks this year, and we do have some residents going to Yosemite. We set up some Pilates classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays at the Tuck Building. We're offering bone builders for seniors on Mondays and Fridays, and those classes are usually held at the Tuck Building, but they're currently being held at the St. James Lodge for the summer season while camp is in session. We're offering yoga year-round at the Tuck Building as well, and we are currently taking registration for our fall flag football league. We run two leagues for children. One is third through fifth grade, and one is sixth through eighth grade, and we also run one for the high school kids, and the fee for that is 65. And I think this will be the 16th year that we've been running that. And I did forget to add that um, I just did a partnership with the Beach Precinct and the state, and we, um, we had a, a, a program down at the beach that we called um, Summer Games, Hampton Beach Summer Games, to go along with the Olympic theme. And um, it was really, it was, it was Ju July 6th. It was a very, very hot day. It was like 90 degrees that day, but it was great fun for the kids. They had a really good time. Gave out ice cream, and that was a big hit. I think that's all for now. Any questions? I don't have any questions, Diana. Great report, and yeah, I went to check out that a little bit on that. Was it June 6th? 
July 6th. Yeah. yeah. That was uh, good. That, that was a good idea to uh, get that age group yeah. involved. Yeah, we're trying to get that teenage yeah. age group. And as far as your report, it looks like you've hit every other age bracket on here for activities. <laughs> we try. So. We try good to job. have something for everyone. Good job. Yeah, nice report. And how, how many kids do you think you service? Do you have a general idea with all the camps and the... Oh, hard to say. I'd have okay. to go back and look. I mean, we have... So summer day camp alone is 65 kids a week. So that's just one camp. We've got flag football camps, probably got 20 kids in it, you know, going on this week. All Basketball right. camps, the same, you know what I'm saying? So it's hard to say, but I could probably come up with that figure. Yeah, no, no, it's good. It's good, you know, because kids that are busy don't get in trouble. Exactly. I mean, it's always a good thing to have. That July 6th thing was good. I did go down yeah. to look at it. You got put to work. And you got put to work. Oh, you did. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to be looking. You got to be on your bicycle. It was a hot day. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was nice. It was nice. It was a good job. Good job on all this. Thank you. So I can be. Uh, thank you, Director, for a great report. Thank Appreciate you. your work very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so in your new capacity as a, was it a uh, so playground? Playground safety inspector. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause I, this week I had some people complaining about the, and I know this isn't under your jurisdiction, but I thought I'd throw it out there for any comments that you might have about the precinct playground. Um, you know, someone came in and said that those are the same exact things that have been there for the last 35 years. <laughs> Well, I will. I have said it before, I, especially when talking about Kids Kingdom. The lifespan of a playground usually is about 14 years, and then you replace it. Kids Kingdom is 21 years, and I'm sure that most of a lot of the stuff at the beach precinct is at least that old. I know they do have some newer things. So, do you work with them at all for that? I haven't. I mean, I went and discussed that playground with them a few years ago about some things that I thought, you know. They had they had one time had a merry go round that was kind of rusted and needed to go and it's gone now. You know what I mean? So. So do you think you could give them some um, I some information now that you've have this new certification? Because I'm going to speak with um, them down there and mention. I know that Chuck himself does a lot of work to try to make it. Yeah, as Paul good Glad as he has can. actually asked me a few things yeah. too. And I do have more information now that I took this exam, and I can actually go down. I have tools that I can go down and check things Yeah, because we need to do something to maybe pump that up a little bit. Yeah. And what about the yoga uh, classes? I hear there's some unhappy ladies because they've been pushed aside at the time start of the yoga. Does that make any sense well, to you? We had to change the time of the yoga because they wanted to have it at the tuck building. So we... So while the kids are off on field trips, they come in and do yoga. So I think it's only a half an hour difference, though. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. So they're not being shortchanged or anything? No, 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 no. They still have the same amount of time and everything. Because I understand that's growing in popularity, mm -hmm. too. But thank you very much. You seem okay. to do a great job with everything. And I agree with what Regina said about you've covered every base with <laughs> the age thing. Thank we'll you. Yep. Strawberry Fest is tomorrow with the firefighters? Correct. And are there still openings in that, or is that? Um, we had a strip about this long today left, and I know we were giving them out all day, people coming in. So I'm sure that we can still fit people in if they want to go. So, But they got to come and get their tickets before noon. <laughs> okay. Because we'll be out of the office then to, to go down to the Strawberry Fest. All right. Thank you. No. So I'm going to next. Yep. Uh, the... Uh, Seasonal pay raises. Seasonal pay raises. Yes. Start with that. Sure. So we put this on the agenda tonight to have a discussion. This is something that um, probably is a no-brainer, but I, there was a couple things as we ran some analysis of the impact. This was something that Diana spoke in her budget last year. The budget passed. Uh, Mr. Demarco touched on it earlier. It is for those folks who are parking lot attendants, camp councils, and the like. There's been pay raises. Diana has has recommended for those folks. They've been like eight dollars for many many years. And moving those folks up to, I think that's. I'm the, trying to get the starting pay rate for working at Hampton Parks and Rec to ten dollars an hour, which is still extremely reasonable. Mm -hmm. But as we did the analysis based on hours passed in the last several years that finance did for us, we see that it's possible that that particular line item may exceed by a, a small amount, a couple thousand dollars here or there. Keep in mind how much money they they derive. The solutions are either to cut back and not have hours, and therefore cut back revenue, which we don't think is a good idea. I, I would like the board support to say, let's do these raises uh, and understand that we may overexpend that. We'll absorb that within the general government line item. It's not a big issue, I don't think, but I felt it was important that the board be aware of that. 
Anything else you need to add or concern? No, I was just going to say, I think that we can probably swing it and get it at the same rate that we have, but just in case it would be better on my stress level. If I don't want them to have to be concerned about yeah. if the weather stays great throughout to cancel s shifts and such. So we used a, a historic, but Christy did some analysis based on the historic over the last several years. And based on the rates we're talking about, it may exceed slightly. I don't see any issues with it. It's just to be safe and to be prudent. I thought we'd bring it to the board, ask for your vote of support for that, and understand that it may overrun short, slightly. We'll absorb that well within the general government budget. And again, one of the amounts of revenue they, they generate, I, I think that's very appropriate. Does that require a motion? It does. Motion of vote I would ask for. I'll make, I'll make a motion for that to we grant the raises to the... Uh, and authorize potentially and to overexpend uh, that line and item. Potential. And, and, and what is ex exactly the pay raise motion? It's going from 8 to $10 per hour. There are a couple of supervisor ranges that go to, help me out with 12. that, to $12 an hour. And oh. I do have some other people, in, not just in parking lots, that would be changing to $10 and other raises too. Uh, I, I support that motion if we're in the discussion mode and we already have a second and that we uh, receive a uh, um, financial impact from the Finance Department. Very good. Thank you. So there's a motion and second. It all is in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And the final area is the discussion that has to do with the authorized, currently the board has set in the past a $20 maximum fee in uh, the parking lots. And go ahead. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I kind of have a hard time with this because I feel like $20 is a good price, uh, you know, a fair price. But over the past three or four years, we've seen what happens is we will fill up and then other par private parking lots will open up and they'll start at $40, $50. And like Victor said, they were even $60 on 4th of July weekend, which in my mind is ridiculous. But um, everybody seems to be doing it. The precinct in our, in, in our, in our lots are kind of staying the same. In the casino, we try to stay kind of together. Um, I was just hoping that maybe we might be able to jump up a little bit higher on special occasions. It wouldn't be an everyday event at all for any, because um, I don't want to gouge the customer either. I, I agree with what Mr. Preston said. We don't want to gouge customers and have them bad mouthing Hampton Beach, you know. And um, But I, I do want to stay fair with, you know, what everybody else is doing. I, don't, I also don't want to shortchange the taxpayers on what we can bring in. So... <clears throat> I'll make a motion to make it $25 for Saturdays and holidays or uh, um, holidays or special some well I that's a holiday yeah, no I don't think I I think it should just strictly stay so Saturday night or you know Saturdays during the day maybe it's Saturdays and Sundays mm -hmm. is that when the it's not necessarily just those days, and that's the issue. Uh, well, I, yep. that's, I'm yep. trying to make something where we have a reason that how people can understand it. That's why I think it should be either on something that you know is the busy time, special event, holiday, mm -hmm. and either Saturday and Sunday, uh, and leave it at that. The reason we have fireworks to begin with is to attract people to the beach, right. and the beach... Uh, people that are paying the special taxes are the ones paying for it. Right. But I think that you need to have a, something that the people will understand. Okay, if we come on Saturday, if we come, I'm not sure if Sunday is the same thing because I don't think people stay as long on Sunday. Right. From what I've seen, there are lots of times that people are gone early on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I think it should really just be Saturday and holidays or special events. And I would like to see it capped at $25. That's 25% increase. Mm -hmm. I don't see it all going to $30. I think that's ridiculous. And I think it's re we should we don't need to compete with these people that are charging $50 and $60. No, I don't want I don't want to raise. They'll have their high. own fall. I agree with that. I don't. I would, I, my, my personal take is I'd like to see us have the flexibility to stay competitive with the casino. And the, the casino is twenty dollars. Is from they what went to I thirty. They went to thirty. Thirty on yeah. on on this weekend. I was actually down there, and I I went around to most of the parking lots to see what they had. Uh, the casino, and I talked with Jake Fleming, and they had they had talked about going to forty, and Jake said no, we're going to keep it at right. thirty. Yep. The beach precinct was at thirty or thirty-five over the weekend. Well, see. 
I mean, that's not what Diane said, though. Well, I, 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 was, I was there. I mean, we try to stay the same as a general rule. And so they're getting 30 yeah. or 35? Yeah. That's yes. why we're here talking about it. Oh, I now, think it's I, now, we, now, we had some private lots down there that, yes, went very questionably ridiculous. they were going up to $60, and that's ridiculous. Going to, to $45 is ridiculous. Um, but I was down the beach on Sunday, and at 9 o'clock, your lot was full. Monday, your lot was full at 9 o'clock and 9.15 in the morning, and the others hadn't even opened yet. Right. And they were waiting to, for us to fill up so they could jack the prices up. Right. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's good business, but that's up to them. They have a right to do that. But I, I, I do think we should have the ability to do similar to what the precinct's doing with the ability to go up to the 30 or $35 the same with even the casino because the casinos stayed they want to make sure people come back right whatever the other lots do that's a different story but i think we should have that ability to be able to go up to those prices just like the precinct has done on both of their lots well i'm disappointed in that i didn't realize they had gone up to that because that's yeah, not what you just said but, well what i did say and, you, and you're right is we try to stay together all week long you know what i'm saying like if they're if the precinct's charging 10 we charge 10 you know 20 whatever it is but this past weekend was like a rude awakening because we we were full and everybody else was making more money. So, I and just, the beach precinct lot was full at the same time you were, and they were getting thirty or thirty-five dollars. Right. So the one thing that I do want to just to add to that is if um, we do come up with a solution of a, of a price that we would that we would be able to go up to, I just want to get permission also to raise the amount of money that we have in the banks because um, our change banks because. Most people will come down to the beach, they'll go to the ATM, they'll get $20 bills, and they'll come and pay us. So if we charge, say, 25 or 30 we're going to need to have more fives or ones available, especially on the weekends when we can't get right back to the bank easily when the traffic is um, standstill or slow moving. Yeah, uh, you know, a couple of things. I agree with what Charlie was talking about, you know, that you don't want to become the town that's ripping off the, the customers. I mean, I think that's outrageous. You go some places and the prices they charge for parking are just ridiculous. You go some places and they don't charge for parking and you say, wow, what a nice town this is. What nice people you can park here without anything. But you have to make money. But, you know, at, at, I think $30 is not outrageous. To go to $30 is not outrageous. You'll pay that most places. You'll pay $30. I mean, it would be nice if that weren't the case, but it's the case, I guess, you need the, the revenue, you need it. The other thing that I, that would, I would want to make sure, and I'm, I'm sure we're do dealing with this also, is that we're being very efficient down there in the collecting of the money and in the counting of the money and everything so that we know, you know, I mean, I know it's part-time employees and it's, that's rough. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's a tough situation sometimes. There are areas of improvement we can have there, but they work hard to, to yeah. deal with those yeah. all the time. We have veterans yeah. there, too. Yeah. We have a lot of veterans, so people have gotten it down pat. Yeah, have we ever thought about going to automated there's been discussion of that but it doesn't allow your flexibility that that's a discussion for another day but yes yeah. there has been consideration of that yeah it is I mean I just I remember Gloucester a few years way back when the, a lot of teachers were working in the summer at Gloucester and it was a dollar for Gloucester and a dollar for themselves. <laughs> yeah and that's always a risk when you're taking cash there's no yeah. question and it's the controls I'm not that saying that I'm not, I'm not even no it's just know, a risk just, absolutely no yeah. question the problem with that is we have leases in the lots too so there'd be no one there to uh, yeah. save those spaces yeah. and then the other problem again is there's not that flexibility on any other day to change the pricing yeah i think yeah. we should set a limit and i know you're having a hard time with, with retaining and keeping help but noticing the church lot the church street lot uh, because that is a dirt lot not having so if we don't have park cars. somebody to park cars we lose a lot of spaces in there and that might be something to think about because we're losing probably 20 30 spaces because people will take up that extra space if we can park them just like it did when i used to work down the state park some 40 years ago mm -hmm. parking cars that's what we used to do and you can you can park more yeah. in there so well i put that in the budget for this year i put in i have a i have a chart that shows like this is this is what we could do to keep within our budget this year no problem doing this and then this is the optimal of having the amount of employees that we would like to have down there and it's just a it's like a difference of four thousand dollars something like that but that's what i put in the budget so that we could do things just like you're saying okay 
I think there are uh, other instances that the precinct does other things with their lot. They have other uh, things that they offer to people for less money than we get. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what they are, but I know that they offer more services to they them. Have, they have overnight parking there. That yeah, they we have, don't have quite a few things that are a little different in the way they charge. So they may not always have as many spaces either. Um, I think they do uh, longer term leasing or some, you know. They, they have a bunch of lease spaces they do down at the, the old Clues lot and the one back out on the old Royal property out, yep. out back. They have a bunch of leases, but we have a number of those leases also. I think theirs are different, though, and uh, from what I've been told. Mr. But Chairman, point, Mr. 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 Pardon me, Rick. Mr. Uh, Regina hasn't spoken on this issue, nor have I. Yes. Um, I just want to say I think that definitely if we can get increased revenue, but we definitely, we sh I don't think we should go too high because I know a lot of people. I agree. The, munis the municipal lots, like a lot of people that work down there, stuff like that, that's where they go. You know, they know they got to get to work early, they got to get to the beach early, they go. And I just feel like unless we can maybe figure out in the future a way to like set something up for residents and workers down there, I think a lot of times, a lot of those cars in there, I mean, I know Sea Catch employees, Boardwalk employees, they all park there. So I think maybe like $30 would be good, but I don't think that we should really, we need to, you know, we, it'd be nice to get more money, but we can't be comparable because we are the town lots. Right, that's my struggle too. I just you know, want to be I mean, able to be with the precinct and the key, and the casino if we can just stay in with them because right. the other lots, I think, are just like we said, they're ridiculous. That's yeah. just this is not Boston. This is Hampton Beach. And know? I know that's where you, that's when you work down there. That's where you flock to. Right, you flock to that lot. Right. So I mean, it's just something to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The agenda item is uh, authorization for an increase in maximum parking fee limits due to the market demand. You're the director. You have key personnel down there. We've all been down there. Uh, the going rate for other governmental agencies that own real estate down there that charge for parking is $30. Period. We've seen it. We've all seen it with our own eyes. Um, we're no different. And we have budgets to make. We have demands for pay increases. Uh, there's real value in parking your car at a Hampton parking lot. It's insured. It's supervised by police. Mm -hmm. It's professionally run. Uh, it's safe. It's lit. There's going to be no incident to speak of there. There's going to be no hooking and jabbing. Uh, there's real value to drop off uh, a, a piece of personal equipment uh, with your family on town property uh, and spend as little as $30 uh, per the director or her management's uh, uh, fee on demand, and, and Rick has said 25. I don't look at it as an increase. I look at it as a, uh, a keeping or uh, a maintaining of parity uh, in, in association with value and real cost. And I think that uh, the uh, Rick has a motion, and I support uh, a, a, a different version, that is we come to parity, that uh, we set a $30 limit, and that uh, it's up to the director uh, and, and their discretion on whether first day of school break and all of these uh, um, exigencies that you're confronted with. Thank you. So we have, have a motion by Rick. Is there a second? Seeing no second, do I have another motion? I would motion that we, uh, in accordance with uh, the uh, agenda item, that we establish a $30 uh, maximum fee per the discretion of the uh, finance or the um, uh, recreation director in accordance with the assistant town manager and the town manager uh, and set the limit at $30 and to uh, um, institute uh, the administrative and uh, financial practices that you mentioned that will have to accompany that in terms of your bank. Thanks. Yep. Effective immediately. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Four to one. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Next thing is old business is. Can I just ask yep. we take out of order if we can sure. talk to the Rocking County Planning Commission? The folks are sure. there in the back if we can invite them to the table now. Sure. And Jason and Rayanne are going to join them as well. Yep. Good evening. Good <laughs> Just introduce yourselves to the board, if you would. Uh, Jason Bashan, town planner. <laughs> Julie LeBrac, senior planner with the Rocky Home Planning Commission. 
Uh, Rayan Dion, Hindu education coordinator. Okay. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, we're here uh, with uh, Julie from the Rockingham Planning Commission and Rayanne um, to ask for your support in um, pursuing a uh, grant with uh, the Rockingham Planning Commission for a uh, high water uh, mark initiative. Um, this uh, goes along with was well, part of the Tides to Storms project discussions, but also goes hand, hand in hand well with our community rating system uh, program that we're working to get into working on our application for that. Um, points can be gained by participating in following through in this initiative through the public information uh, component of the community rating system. And uh, we think it would be a, a worthy uh, project for the town and educating the public about flood risks. Um, I don't know if Julie wants to discuss further on that. Or? Um, yes, to support everything that Jason said. This was actually an activity that the town um, several times in, indicated during the Tides to Storms um, coastal assessment pro process that they would want to do because it raises the visibility of flooding. We all forget when it hasn't, we haven't had a large flood or a large, large storm in a decade, <clears throat> just how much damage and how much flooding we actually have. So it's a way of, to implement or install a visual reminder of what flooding can look like in your community. And basically what it looks like, typically, the examples that are on the FEMA's website are typically installations of a post of some kind, either a wooden post or, or a, a metal post that's square, and it often has a sign attached to it. And on the sign, there's a line that says, here's what the flood was like on X, X day. You can also depict other types of flooding, like you can put the, uh, the elevation of the 100-year storm. Uh, you could put elevations of projected sea level rise over time on, on it. So you can actually have multiple flood levels on, on the same installation, or, or just one if you just want to show how, what, what flooding was like in the, in the biggest storm that the, the community experienced. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, I meant to check to see on what the range of points were, were for this initiative under the community rating system that we're preparing, and I forgot to bring that number in. But one thing I can say is that you get more points the more public outreach and, and involvement that you have as part of the project as far as the launch and the um, um, announcements of it and, and the um, advertising of, of it. So the other component of the project is not only the installations, which we're hoping to do in Portsmouth, Rye, and in Hampton. Um, it's we're, The other part are our researchers from the, United, uh, the University of New Hampshire are coming up with a on-based, uh, a web-based portal called a storyboard, which will talk about different flood issues, um, different issues with land management, um, different issues with resiliency and adapting to changing conditions. And this will be one of the stories on the storyboard. So as part of the project, I would be actually writing up the story, putting together uh, an online um, digital version of it with pictures and narrative, maybe some quotes, some photographs. Um, so that's the last component of the project. So that actually will, will live outside of the physical location where it, at, where it actually is installed. And of course, the town can decide where they want to install it. We, we did build in some money into the budget to have uh, discussions with, say, for example, Dred, if, it, if, we, if, it, if, it was, if there was interest in having it installed on state property as opposed to municipal property. The other option is instead of ha having an <coughs> excuse me an installation, is you can actually do the same sort of we call benchmarking of different flood elevations on the side of a building, an existing building. That's an easier way to go, less construction costs, less you know installation costs, and and we can fund, we estimate um, up to two installations per town with the budget we put together. And I do do have a, a revised copy of of a budget. Initially, we thought it may cost about ten thousand dollars per community to do this, but because of the we have two other communities joining in on it. This, this, the scale of doing three at once is, is actually less expensive. And I've had conversations with a couple of surveyors to find out how much it would actually cost to do the survey work to actually um, label the, 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 get the different elevations on the installation. And I, I found somebody that actually was very enthusiastic about it and would do it at a nominal fee. And I also was talking with uh, staff from FEMA headquarters in, in Washington, D.C. about the level of support that FEMA staff would actually be providing as part of the project. So we're able to massage some of the numbers and reduce some of the cost. So we're estimating that the grant ask will be $8,000 with a match, an in-kind match or, um, of $4,000 from the town. And that will be coming yeah, from I was going to say a lot of that would be from time. staff substantially, if not entirely, from staff time. So the reason we put this on here is there was a request for the board to give a letter of support for the grant 
there was this in-kind match. I wanted you to be able to see that and understand that, that, that it may take some staff time and it may, you know, Public Works assist in with putting in a post or something of that nature. Uh, but I wanted to come before the board, have these folks present. It, the other benefit to us is reaching points in that project of the CRS that we've talked about that Rayanne and Jason are working on for us. So we thought it'd be beneficial to put it before the board and ask for the letter of support. Regina? I don't have any questions. It sounds like a really good idea to me. I think it's a great idea, especially with the community rating, if you get points on uh, the community rating, because okay. people are so aware of flood insurance right. and all that. And any, any way we can do, reduce that is great. And uh, we, we know what storms can do. So <laughs> it's Certainly. great to have awareness. Phil? Oh. Negative. Rick? So what we need now is a, mo a motion, motion to, to support, letter, support. Letter of support from the board for the grant process and authorize the, the potential in-kind match that's necessary. I make that motion that we do the letter of support and the in-kind. Uh, Sorry, what am I doing wrong? Just one comment, no. There, there may be some monetary costs involved in it. So, so for example, a purchase of the actual post that something would be installed on, maybe concrete to, to put it in the ground. So there may be some purchase of materials, but I think it would be... It would be yeah, the minimus based no, on that number. Yeah. Yeah. Hampton is not the applicant on this. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so I, I maintain that motion. I have a motion. Second. Second it. All those in favor? Opposed? Two, three, three to two. <coughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, for all business? I believe we are. Uh, Old business, uh, non-union pay adjustments. Uh, would you like me to yep. talk? So the board has been addressing this issue for a number of times, number of meetings. Um, would you like me to talk about what the decisions yep. are? So the board has decided to um, put 2% pay raises to the non-union employees, a 3% pay raise to the deputy chief of police and the administrative assistant to the chief of police, and a $10,000 pay adjustment uh, to the chief of police uh, to make his salary competitive with others in the area um, after an analysis has been done uh, assessing where all of these employees stand. Effective April 1. Correct. Thank you, sir. So um, I need a motion. Uh, a little discussion. It's a motion to confirm. Correct. In, in just uh, an amplification of the Health Care Act, is there any significance with that? Yes, sir. I beg your pardon. That that in discussions with these uh, percentages for the three and a half, the three percent and the ten percent, that so we will uh, seek to have the same language as we have with the contracts that have passed um, for the ACA language as well. Okay. So a motion to confirm. Is that what you? Yes. All right. I'll make that motion to confirm. All right. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any other discussion. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I just want to, you know, just say that that. This is after extensive research on what people have done in the prior year, the the uh, advancements that's been made in different departments, and in looking at other other towns and what they're paying their employees. You know, and then we felt that 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 we really had had a lot of positive movement in the last year from our employees, and that they deserve a raise to reflect what they've been doing. And so this this is not just something that we came up with. You know, Jamie did an awful lot of research on it. Did an awful lot of research on in going back to what everybody had performed, what their performance had been for the year, and we decided to do this. Any other discussion? I revert back to my comments uh, with the uh, uh, police chief's uh, uh, brief uh, that that uh, his uh, with rapid onset become one of the most uh, singularly. Uh, dangerous and most challenging professions uh, in the United States of America, uh, and these uh, these uh, contractual and, and uh, monetary uh, adjustments are are certainly in line with that. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, new business. We've already done. Is there any other new business? There is one I have, sir, and that is from uh, the Public Works, a request that um, the D DPW has asked Jamco, the vendor who did the work on the drainage in the center of town previously, to come back and repair certain items in that area. Um, and they're requesting the authorization from the board to do two nights of work to accomplish that, rather than deal with the daytime traffic and the issues in the summer, what have you. It's prudent to do it at nighttime work. It won't be an all-night thing. Excuse, but they excuse me. Yes. Um, yeah. Mr. Ells and Mr. Flurry? Yeah. yeah. Al, Mr. Ellis, can you please stand by as soon sure, as you yeah. finish up? They've been here all night waiting. They obviously came here to speak. Huh. They, 
I spoke to Al previously. We talked about putting him on on the agenda next meeting, but not for this evening. But if we want to, the board wants to have a conversation. Well, I, I just wanted to sure. be yeah. courteous, and I know we had touched on it this morning. But go ahead. Pardon me for interrupting. Come back. Yeah. So, how would you like to proceed? Well, let's let's deal with so this. So the Jamco issue is two days authorization um, at authorization to work two nights to solve the issues that uh, they're going to do some saw cutting of pavement, small amount of excavation, brick repair, compaction, and repaving. Uh, and they'd like to be able to do this work over the next two weeks or sometime in the next two weeks. I, I think it worked very well when they were there last year when they were working on it. However, I think that uh, Jen did a great job at notifying the people, and I would hope that she would be uh, going around and talking with the businesses before they started just to let them know what was happening just so that they will understand. I think that worked very well last year. I know the, be the businesses were very appreciative of that. So... We can absolutely make sure that the schedule is notified to the businesses. Yes. So you want to have a motion for this? Is yeah, I think it'd be prudent we do that. I have a motion to allow Jam Co to work the two nights. Yes, I make that motion. Second, Mr. Bean. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Uh, you want to talk with vote? What do you have? You want to invite them up? Do you, you folks have something you want to present? Speak or your piece, whatever, whatever you folks talk about this morning, but. Um, <clears throat> Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Mr. Manager. Uh, we, uh, we were here, coming here this evening to ask the board to consider the, uh, the pending application for an entertainment license at what has been uh, Big Bernie's Beach Bar for the last several years. You're probably all aware that Al uh, Fleury is in the process of expanding that operation uh, at number 73 Ocean Boulevard. Uh, what used to be Le Bec Rouge at 71 became Ernie's Beach Bar. Uh, he's recently gone through the planning process and gained uh, approval for the plan. He's under construction now. And uh, he has a pending uh, application for uh, uh, the entertainment license. I know noise would be the primary issue. I assume noise would be one of the primary issues, and we've had a, uh, a report done by uh, a sound professional which was submitted to the planning board as part of the uh, condition of approval. Uh, because it's not formally on the, on the agenda tonight, uh, it's probably not appropriate to go too much further because uh, I would think uh, the chief probably, chief of police should probably be here. Uh, and uh, we had put a call in to let him know we were coming so he would be able to think about it. But uh, it apparently never got on the agenda formally. So, so if I may, I, I had a discussion with Mr. Flory today. We had a discussion about this to put it on the next meeting. We had a discussion about the current issue that he has. Um, and I think it's prudent based on the community's input on this that that be noticed and everybody have an opportunity I, to be I, heard. I agree. You've got to have notice. Absolutely. Yep. So we hadn't had that today. We discussed about the next meeting. Um, I'm not sure that there is. I haven't seen a pending application. I looked at Carl. My understanding is going to be seeking a modification of the current entertainment the license. The current entertainment license. Correct. They're all due at the same time. So I was issued my other one. Yeah, in April. I looked at the, the we talked today. Right. I understood the chief come out and see you today? Or did you, you, you he just touched base with me on the way out and said that we were going to do a walkthrough tomorrow. But I guess... What I'd like to ask for is just kind of guidance on how to, because there's been so much all over the place with the noise stuff and the licensing in the last couple of years, now my venue, if you want to call it, has changed. I have a large inside portion. I have a stage on the other portion. It's different than any other place. And before we have to go to, like, you know, the whole, you know, new stuff, do laws and everything, I just... I didn't know if it would behoove me to apply for like a completely different license before the next meeting in regards to like more of an explanation of like what I have to offer now with an inside like do I need an inside license now and an outside license because the timing and the restrictions are different from everybody and over the fourth when the chief was down there basically you know there are restrictions on my license so I want to make sure, like, that it's clear 
yeah. when I come back for next Monday. And, and in discussions with him today, what, what I see looking at your permit is the current approved permit um, has, or the board has authorized that your outdoor entertainment not, ex not continue past 11 p.m. Correct. Now, you've had modifications to my understanding on the, you now have an indoor section. Yes. The board's order deals with outdoor entertainment. That's what the directive is. So on your current permit, if you say have an indoor, like your other establishments, and you can close the doors and you can control that, the board's directive on your entertainment is outdoor entertainment, nothing after 11 p.m. So if you have an indoor section, I think there could be an argument made that that doesn't apply to the indoor section. Probably prudent to come in and clarify that on the 25th with an official, but I think if you have discussions with the chief and get his uh, assessment of what would be enforceable under that I think it's pretty clear the focus was on outdoor right if your condition has changed and there's indoor and we talked about your minor stuff your right. televisions what have you as long as the doors are closed like your other establishments are doors are closed it's a confined indoor location then I don't think that's in violation of what's there can I should I still use that old application or should I just clean it up it would to me it would be prudent that you apply for a clarification to the board that will notice everyone allow the public to be heard and this issue can be put to get bad based on those issues okay that's what I'd suggest yeah and uh, was it you mr. Griffin who was on the planning board for this approval uh, you'll recall the uh, the outside venue at the old uh, Big Bernie's was creating a little trouble for the folks at Harris Sea Ranch this new project, the stage has been moved, what, two, three hundred feet, at least two hundred feet. It was almost two hundred. To the south, and it is going to be completely enclosed on three sides. And we have a great, you know, great sound engineer. Uh, we'll, we'll submit that application. Al will be able to explain it. But it, it literally is able, they are literally able to control the sound, the direction, and the distance of projection. So, uh, and I know the chief uh, was, was very happy at the professional review committee when he learned that we were going to move the outside venue as far to the south as we were with this new enclosure. So those are the kind of things we'll be talking about. Uh, I think it is a whole new different situation and perhaps uh, we can put something together in the next day or two, get it to the, uh, the manager so that it, it can be included. Uh, for maximum notice, because I suspect there might be someone in, in the public who might be interested in I this. I suspect that may be the case. Yeah. All, All right. Well, All right. I, thank you for letting us come up, and it was Very just good. just a scheduling thing, and we enjoyed listening to the uh, the business. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Closing comments. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, you would uh, the board at the close would want to. Uh, Move to go into a non-public session under RSA 91 hyphen capital A colon 3 Roman 2 small e uh, consideration of pending litigation. Make a motion that need a motion for that. Need a yes. motion. Yep. A second it. All those in favor. And you need, need, need a roll call in that respect. Aye. 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 Bill. Aye. Aye. Okay. Did you, yeah, okay. Do you want a motion to adjourn? No, no, no. You adjourn in the non. So, uh, that, we have here Attorney Brian Cullen, who is 